Corinthians 4 verses 6 through to 10. And this is what it says. For God has said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Now, before this passage, Paul spoke to the church in Corinth and he told them that the God of this world has blinded them. Oftentimes in our lives, we see many people blinded by the God of this world. We see many people blinded by Satan. They don't want to give up the pleasures of this world. They have hardened their hearts to God. Why? Because they don't want to give up their lives. They don't want to live a life committed to God. Because that means that they will have to give up some things. And many people don't want to do it. And this was what Paul was speaking to in the church of Corinth. Who went on with their sinful ways. And he told them, no, you need to live for God. You have the light now. And you need to live in that light. And that is what we as Christians must do. Now in verse 6, Paul referenced two things. <clears throat> Firstly, he referenced the famous verse in Genesis where God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, one thing that we need to remember is in the beginning, the sun and moon wasn't there. That was only created on the fourth day. But in the beginning, God was the light. He was the one who shone his light on the world. And that is the same message that we have. In the gospel. Jesus Christ let light shine out of darkness and he let the light shine into our hearts in the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? We have the gospel, we have the light because of God. Because of what Jesus did on that cross. He is the reason why we have that light and why we can go out and proclaim that light. He is the purpose for that light. And then He is also the message that we proclaim. He is the one who brings light into our hearts and lets us go out and be a light in this dark world. And then the second thing that Paul referred to is, uh, and we read about this in Acts 26, verse 17 to 18, and this is his testimony. This is when he stood in front of King Agrippa and he said this, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. For when he received the light, he heard Jesus telling him, I am sending you. In the Great Commission, we see Jesus Christ saying the same words to his disciples. He says, I am sending you. You. We need to proclaim the gospel and bring the light in this dark world. That is our mission and our purpose as Christians. Now, we are all part of the same body of Christ. So how you may do it may be different from how I do it. But we all share in that same calling of going out and spreading the gospel. Now, I know many people here might be afraid to share the gospel. What will this person think of me? What will they say when they see me sharing the gospel? Will they look down on me? Will they even receive it? What you don't want to tell you, don't pray to God to take away that fear. Pray to God that He will fill you with more love. The Bible says that perfect love calls out all fear. You see, when you are filled with the love of God, you cannot help but go out and share the gospel. If you saw someone you love standing in the street, and you see a car coming towards him, and you just stand there and say, Yas, you go, you do, you boo. Would that be a loving thing to do? No, that wouldn't a loving thing to do would be to warn them and tell them, No, a car is coming, you need to get out of way. 
out of the way. And that is one thing that we need to stand firm on in spreading the gospel. We need to preach repentance. We need to preach Christ crucified. And yes, that message may have pulled uh, John the Baptist his head. And yes, even Jesus preached that gospel. And that did not make him popular among the Pharisees and the Pharisees. But that truth is transforming and life-changing to those that accept it. And that is the message that we must stand firm on. Now, let me give you another example. And I'll give my younger brother out of here as an, ex uh, as an example. So, if I see him getting a really bad attitude with me, would the loving thing of me be to do is to snap it out of him? Or tell him, no, Alpha, you know what, you're not going to get that attitude with me. And warn him about the consequences of that. No, I'm joking. I'll, I can give you a better example than that. So, um, if you are a parent, you know you want the best for your children. And that might not always look like what your children think it should look like. If they want to go to a party where you know there will be drugs and alcohol involved, what would be the loving thing to do? Would it be to let them go where you know what will happen? Or would it be to tell them no because you know better, because you love them, because you want the best for them? You see, we have this messed up view in today's world that love and tolerance go together. But love does not mean I tolerate everything you do. Love means that in despite of what this world says, I love you and I want the best for you. And that is what God wants for you as well. And that might not be that you live in your simple way because God clearly calls us against that. And so today, that is the message that I stand firm on because I know that when Jesus shines his light and you will come out of darkness, that that is the light and the calling that God has for you to live in life, a life of repentance. And that might not always look like or line up with what your flesh wants, just like the church in Corinth, but that lines up with what God wants for you because he loves you and he is a loving father. Now in verse 3 we read the following, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. Now one thing that we need to understand is that in that time, uh, jars were used a lot. And uh, they were, especially jars, they were very efficient containers, but they were very cheap and they were very easy to break. They were very fragile. And even to the point where um, uh, glass containers were considered an upgrade from clay jars. Now the question that we have is why would God deliberately have chosen something so fragile and unimpressive to use as containers for this great treasure? And the answer in that is simple. Paul wants us to understand that the power of God's glory is from him, it is in him, and it leaves no room to suggest that the power comes from any man, or from Paul, or from any other person. The power is in the gospel. The power is in us standing here and proclaiming Christ crucified and that he has conquered the grave. The power is in that. The power is in God. Just like it was in the beginning. God doing everything. It is not in us. We are mere fragile and unimpressive beings. We have sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But I thank God that this message this great news, the best news, does not rely on me, but it relies on God. We even see Paul saying that um, he planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but it is God who caused it to grow. So yes, God makes us uh, a part of this mission. He makes us a part of this plan. He calls you to share this gospel. But the pressure isn't on us. Yes, we need to go out, we need to share the gospel, but the pressure to see that seed grow falls on God. When Jesus sent out the disciples, he, says, he said, go to and to go together, share the gospel. And if they reject it, dust off your feet. You did your part. And that's what we need to do. We need to go out and do our part and trust that God will do the rest. And then another thing that I want you to remember is that the power of the gospel is so great that it is not limited by the quantity of its containers, but its message of us proclaiming that Jesus Christ is crucified and that He is risen. And in that message, there is freedom, power, and healing. So I don't stand here today to share a message about myself. I don't stand here today to tell you a story about myself. Because I am a sinful human being. 
just like Paul, who said, I'm the greatest sinner of all. But thank God that Jesus is perfect and I thank God for His message and that I can proclaim that tremendous and great message. And that is the greatest honor of my life and that should be yours as well. And then the last part of this passage we read, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Now, does this sound like something um, opposite of what some of you have already heard? Let me give you an example. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the Bible says, or God says, I know the plans that I have towards you. Plans to prosper you, give you hope and a future. Wow, God is going to bless me. He's going to give me everything that I want. All the riches in the world. God has plans for me. He's going to make me rich. He's going to make me healthy. Well, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? Well, let's read in a verse before that. And this is verse 10. <clears throat> for thus saith the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring back and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and hope. This promise wasn't even for that generation. We read in previous passages where um, Jeremiah had to address this people and he said, uh, There are false prophets who are proclaiming a message that your time in exile will only last a few years and that was not the case. And in even previous passages before that, we also see that uh, Paul, uh, the, the Jeremiah I told these people and he said that you must go and have kids and grandchildren. Why? Because you're going to be here for a while, so buckle up. And that's what I want to tell you today. Buckle up, because the Christian life is not meant to be easy. Our treasure is not here on earth, it is in heaven. The question that I have for you today is where is your treasure? Do you want to settle for this idea that God promised us temporary things? Or do you want to settle for the truth that the promises of God are eternal? The Bible even says that Satan is the God of this world. And that is not my world, or that's not my words. That is the words of the Bible. So God's kingdom is not of this world. It is for the next world, the new world, the new heaven. And we need to remember that as Christians when we go through these very difficult times. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 9 to 10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, God will give us supernatural strength and supernatural peace when we rely on God. But the problem, the problem with so many Christians is they build their lives on this idea that God will give them the desires of their hearts and even that uh, takes the take completely out of context. But if God will give them everything and what happens when the troubles come? What happens when the hardships come? What happens when they get sick and they don't get healed? When the family members become sick and they have all the faith in the world and that person doesn't get healed. Their faith gets shaken and they desert God. Why? Because they have this idea of God which simply isn't true. When we truly understand the gospel and Jesus Christ and the power of the light in us, that God will give us the supernatural strength and supernatural peace. These passages bring us so much more healing and it is so much more or it is so much greater than we can ever imagine than just saying, okay, God, God is going to give me everything that I want. God is going to make sure that I am rich. God is going to make sure that I am healthy. Because the Bible is so much more relevant than that. The Bible tells us that yes, we will face hardships. Yes, we will have to deal with problems. But God will be with us every step of the way. Yes, until the very end of age. Now, if you want to experience the fullness of God's power, you need to face difficulties. If you want to experience the fullness of God's joy, you need to go through tribulations. If you want to experience the fullness of God's peace, 
You need to experience troubles. And that is the purpose for us as Christians. To see God in everything. To glorify God in everything. To worship God in everything. What is your goal as a Christian? If the only goal that matters and that is growing in your relationship with God, worshiping Him, honor, uh, honoring Him, glorifying Him. And so many people say that when I get sick, how does that bring glory to God? When I go through hardships, how does that bring glory to God? But the God wants to tell you when Paul and Silas were in their prison, they worshiped God in spite of their situation. That brought glory to God. When you see people going through hardships and they have this joy that cannot be explained, this peace that nobody can understand, that brings glory to God. And that will only be possible when we have God's light inside of us. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go out and to see how difficult we can make our life. But what I am telling you is just like what Paul said. We need to stand up and be bold when it comes to sharing the gospel. In spite of death, in spite of persecution, in spite of everything. Because we know that God is with us every single step of the way. We need to stand firm on the truth. Because that is what the love for God and for others will lead us to do. And when hardships come as a result of that life, for us standing firm on God's word and for sharing the gospel, then we can rest assured knowing that God's strength, God's joy, and God's peace will guide us through anything. The life of a Christian is not meant to be easy, but I can guarantee you it's worth it. Let's pray. Father God, today I want to pray that we will see your light, that you will reveal your light to each and every person here, that they would know that you are the light, that you are the one who helps us to see everything the way they are in this dark world, that we will also reflect your light and go out and show the glory of your great name, that we will go out and love others as you have commanded us to do. I pray that you will help us not only hear your word, but go out and live your word. And know that even though hardships and troubles and difficulties may come, that you will be with us every single step of the way. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your peace and your strength in everything. We pray that you will be with every single person here today and that they will go out and proclaim the gospel boldly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.